So we're going to prove this lemma. And I think we're going to have a fair bit of time left over after that. So I may as well just start going into next week's material. This is an introduction to that once it finishes, if we have the time. So let's prove the lemma. This is all that's left now. And I, I just quickly looked over the proof in the break. We don't need self adjoinedness of V. V is just a bounded operator. So this operator we constructed capital V earlier on out of the identity operator, we didn't need self adjoinedness of that. That was just a nice little coincidence. So because U is compact, we can do the spectral theorem on U and that gives us a spectral resolution. And that's basically why we need compactness in all of this stuff. Let's take E sub lambda, lambda in the spectrum of U to be a spectral resolution, countable, spectral resolution. So that U is the sum over lambda in the spectrum of U, lambda times E sub lambda and f of u is defined in a similar way. If you want to do all of this stuff in non-compact or potentially non-bounded self-adjoint operators, you use the spectral theorem for self-adjoint operators. You have spectral measures and all of that, and you have a, a much harder argument, but this is the core of the arguments the same. So anyway, you've got that. You can write out the commutator of f of u against v using that representation of f of u. Of course, commutators are, are linear, so you can take out that sum. You can take out the scalar f of lambda, which commutes with everything. Then you have e sub lambda times v minus v times e sub lambda. That's what a commutator is. And we'll add in some extra terms in this sum just to make things a bit nicer. We'll write this as E sub lambda V times the sum over mu in the spectrum of E sub mu, because this sum is the identity operator. We can multiply that minus, and then we put the same thing. We put in this identity operator seen through the spectral resolution times V E lambda. So we can symmetrize the whole thing, start to make it look like a sure multiplier. So then you take those sums out you get a sum over lambda and mu in the spectrum of f of lambda times e sub lambda v e sub mu minus e sub mu v e sub lambda. Right, now how can we simplify this guy? We see that we're actually looking at, we're looking at the same sum twice here, just indexed in a different way. If you swap lambda and mu, you see we've actually got the same sum appearing here. So what you can do is you can write both of those as in the same way. And you, what you get is you get the sum over lambda and mu in the spectrum of f of lambda minus f of mu times e sub lambda v e sub mu. Does that argument make sense? Because that's a, a nice little argument, not too difficult, but you know, little symmetry thing. You've got f of lambda here, e sub lambda is out the front, but here you've got e sub u at the front. So what that should mean is there should be an f of mu also appearing when you write it down properly. So anyway, we're at this point here. And if lambda is equal to mu, then this is zero. So you may as well just write lambda not equal to mu here. Because when lambda is mu, nothing happens, right? And this looks like a sure multiplier. This is a sure multiplier, actually. So the same argument. shows that if you take f to be the identity function, you've got the commutator of u with v is the sum over lambda not equal to mu in the spectrum of u of lambda minus mu, e sub lambda v e sub mu. So what this says is that if we define a symbol, well, an infinite matrix M sub lambda mu, depending on F in this way, we take F of lambda minus F of mu divided by lambda minus mu for lambda not equal to mu and zero for lambda equal to mu. This 
this shows that the commutator of f of u with v is actually this Schur multiplier with this symbol. It's a bit confusing the way it's written. Applied to the commutator of u with v. Because the commutator of u with v can be written out like, like this. And if we divide these coefficients by lambda minus mu and then multiply by f of lambda minus f of mu, we get the commutator of f of u with v. So we get this nice sure multiplier relation here. So actually, the result we want to prove is actually a, a sure multiplier bound in this result with this particular choice of symbol. The problem is this symbol is not a function of lambda minus mu. Symbols that are functions of lambda minus mu, you can actually write as symbols coming from Micklin symbols if you have the Micklin condition. And then you can apply the previous result. But here we have f of lambda minus f of mu because the function f is not linear, right? It's just a Lipschitz function. If it were linear, you'd be fine, but it's not linear. If it were linear, the result would be trivial. So somehow we need to reduce this sure multiplied into sure multipliers we actually know how to bound. Let's just say not a function of lambda minus mu. So the trick is how do you reduce this down to sure multipliers that are functions of lambda minus mu? And this proof is really quite clever. So we need to make some reductions first. Just a simple reduction. If you, what are we assuming on the function f? It's Lipschitz and it maps the real line to the real line. That's all we're assuming. What you can actually do is you take this function f tilde of t, which is the function f, but take away the value at zero. Multiply that by the Lipschitz norm of f to the minus one and then add 2t. What's so good about this transformation? F tilde has got the following properties. F tilde of zero is zero because we subtract it off F of zero. And we know that the slope of F tilde, all of these slopes are between one and three for all lambda not equal to mu. Because by dividing through by, the, by this Lipschitz constant, you can make the Lipschitz constant be bounded by one. And then by adding this 2t, the slope gets forced to be between one and three. In particular, the slope is, okay, the slope is bounded because the function is Lipschitz, but the slope is also bounded from below, away from zero. So the function always has to move at least sublinear, uh, super linearly. That turns out to be important. So if you can show the result for f tilde, then you actually have it for f as well, because if you take f of u commutated with v, you can actually write this then out as the Lipschitz constant of f times the commutator of f tilde u with v minus two times the commutator of u with v. This is just unpacking the definition of f tilde. The constant comes from here. Subtracting f of zero actually does nothing because subtracting a scalar gives you something that commutes with everything. So it doesn't appear in the commutator. And this two here goes there. <laughs> So if you can prove the result for f tilde, you get the result for f. Basically a homogeneity and translation and scaling argument here. So we can assume without loss of generality that f of zero is zero and that all of the slopes of f are between one and three. That's going to make life easier for us. And this is going to be used in the following trick, which I will call the amazing trick, just because that's for some reason what it says on my notes. I must have really liked it when I was writing it up. This is an amazing trick. I don't know how you'd come up with this. This is just, it's like that Borgan argument. This is one of those things you see it, it's like, how would you come up with that? For values of x between one and three, okay, x is gonna be the slope of f, of course. Values of x between one and three, we write 
x as e to the 2 pi t, where t is log x on 2 pi. OK, sure. And that t is between 0 and 1. OK, sure, whatever. Nothing miraculous there, but why would you do that? Choose a function psi, a Schwartz function on the real line, such that psi of t is equal to e to the 2 pi i t. Do I want the i here? Should I have that? 2 pi t, not 2 pi i t. Psi of t is e to the 2 pi t for t between 0 and 1. And it can do whatever it likes outside that interval, as long as it's a Schwartz function. Of course, you can do that. This being having these values on the interval from zero to one does not obstruct you from being a Schwartz function. Then let's write x as psi of log x on two pi. All right, this is true. This is for x between one and three still. Otherwise, this doesn't work. And we use Fourier inversion on psi. That's the amazing trick. Psi hat of s e to the 2 pi i log x on 2 pi ds. And that is the integral of psi hat of s times x to the i s ds. It's a miracle. <laughs> You've got this little identity x equals that for x between 1 and 3 for not just one particular choice of psi, but any psi that's equal to this exponential function between zero and one. Miracle of Fourier analysis. Why would you think of doing this? No idea, but it works. So having done that, we can write out our sure multiplier that is not of the right form. It's a sum over lambda not equal to mu in the spectrum of u of f of lambda minus f of mu on lambda minus mu. Okay, there are no absolute values there before, but we've arranged it such that these slopes are always between one and three. So in particular, they're always positive and you can put in the absolute values for free. E sub lambda commutator E sub mu. This is what we're dealing with. Now this slope is always between one and three. So you apply the miraculous identity of the previous lines. You write it as an integral over R psi hat of s times f lambda minus f of mu to the is lambda minus mu to the minus is e sub lambda commutator e sub mu ds and what you see here is that if you just if you fix s this is a sure multiplier of the right form this is also a sure multiplier of the right form. It's a miracle. You can write this as the integral over R psi hat of S of a sure multiplier with a, a different countable spectral project, countable spectral resolution. I'll say what it is of a symbol M sub S times another sure multiplier with the, the original countable spectral resolution with a different symbol M sub minus S of the commutator uv ds where the symbol m sub s let's write m sub s lambda mu is hang on my notes are a bit stupid there we go takes this form this is what our symbols are this ms and this m minus s both have this form we change s to, s to minus s if you need to. And where this sure multiplier here is defined with respect to the spectral resolution that looks like this it offers in f of the spectrum, basically changing variables on the spectral projection. Because this slope of f's between one and three, f's invertible. <laughs> so you can do this. So you've got f inverse. And that's why you get f of lambda and f of mu instead of lambda and mu. So you might ask at this point, 
couldn't we just do this originally? Like we had f of lambda minus f of mu. We said that wasn't a function of lambda minus mu. It's still not, but we changed the spectral projection indexing so that it all works out. The thing is that we need this power is here so that the functions are actually bounded. This function lambda minus mu to the is is actually bounded by one. Complex exponentials do that. Well, it's not bounded by one. It's bounded by the, the size of this thing, whatever. Where is it? Hang on. I forgot how complex exponentials work. Yeah, it's a beauty modular thing. So, okay, are these sure multipliers bounded? They're of the right form, but is this a Michelin symbol? We have sure multipliers. Coming from the symbol. So it's phi sub s mapping the real line other than the origin into the complex numbers. Phi sub s of xi is absolute value of xi to the is for some s in the real line. This is well defined for real numbers that are not zero. Do a branch cut, whatever, to define your complex powers, doesn't matter. We need to check whether that's a Michelin symbol. So for all psi, the absolute value of this is, is one, I claim. I can't exactly remember why that is. Why does that work with complex power? That just works, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. So we have boundedness and we have to check the derivative. What we need is that this is bounded over psi. And when you compute this derivative, I mean, you can do it in a couple of ways. I'm just going to write out, copying my notes, what you end up getting. That's one way to do the derivative. Use a chain rule or whatever. And this ends up being bounded by the size of S. So they're not bounded uniformly in S, but for each S they're bounded. And you have this linear control in S. So this tells you that the Michelin norm of that symbol is bounded by one plus absolute value of S. And for us, that's good enough. So let's take this quantity here. Let's just copy and paste it. Is that copy? Yep. I don't copy and paste much on this thing. So what we need to bound is this. We need to bound the, the Schatten norm of that. So we put the norm on the inside. DS. And each of these sure multipliers now we can bound and the norm will depend on the Michelin norm of that symbol we computed before. So this is bounded with constant depending on P by psi hat of S. So we have the Michelin norm of the function phi sub S, which is one plus S, absolute value. Then we have the same with minus S, so we get another one of those. And then we have the Schatten norm of this commutator. And this doesn't depend on S anymore. So we can throw it there. And we just end up with this integral in S. The psi is a Schwartz function. And therefore, so is psi hat, which means that it decays much faster than this polynomial grows, which means that this is bounded. Well, the integral is finite. That's what happens there. And we are done. I think we're done at that point. Yep, we are, I guess. Yes. Yeah, we went way under time there. We proved everything we wanted to prove. <laughs> but this proof is a little bit fast and confusing. Are there any questions about it? Kind of all just follows from that miracle identity. Gibbo, you got a question? You just put your camera on. Me? No. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was by accident. I thought you had a question. Okay, let's just quickly go to the, the key points of this proof, I guess, which is here, and just have a think, what's, what exactly is going on here? 
Does that make sense to everybody? This is, I don't really know a better way to explain it than I did. I mean, it's just, it, it all really falls out of that identity. Where did that prove that? Here, this one. Being able to write this, this slope actually is a, this Fourier inversion argument is an integral in S with complex powers. It's this kind of reproducing formula for, for numbers. It's, yeah, quite miraculous. I don't know what else to say about that. And yeah, if we didn't do it that way, we'd end up with a symbol that was, instead of being absolute value of Xi to the IS, we would just have absolute value of Xi, which is not bounded and therefore it's not a Michelin symbol. So you're not gonna have boundedness of the associated Fourier multipliers. But when you get this S dependence in here, like that, the integral in S, you start to see Michelin symbols that grow, well, that grow linearly, but you integrate them against the Schwartz function. So that doesn't matter. Okay. So we proved the lemma. That means we've proven the theorem. Where's the theorem? That's the lemma. We proved that quite miraculously. And we had this reduction by putting in clever choices of capital U and capital D just to write a, a difference in terms of a, a commutator, which is an argument that comes up quite a few times. Like this argument wasn't invented for this theorem. Difference estimates are strongly related with commutator estimates. That just happens in operator theory. And yeah, the upshot of all of that is this potapov sukhachev theorem, which has nothing to do with Barnack valued analysis, but which we did manage to prove by reduction to the UMD valued Michelin theorem, which is nice. If you want to do it for general non-compact operators, you have to use a UMD valued color and Zygmunt theorem. You do still reduce it to UMD valued stuff, but you don't use the Michelin theorem anymore. You, instead of getting Fourier multipliers, you get more difficult singular integral operators, but you can still use the UMD property to bound them. And you have to go into much deeper spectral theory than just spectral theory of compact operators, but it does work in the end. Anyway, that's a good theorem. We proved it. Uh, I'll move on to the next topic if there's no other questions about this. Now's your chance. No, cool. I haven't written the notes for the next lecture, so I'm kind of having to, you know, improvise here. Hopefully it's not too terrible. I'll just give you the introduction to the last topic without any proofs, because if I do proofs, I'll mess them up. So that's all we're gonna say about operator theory. We have one more week, so only really two more lectures. So we have to really cram in one last topic. And one of the first theorems I stated in lecture one, I think it was lecture one, so theorem by Krapien. I think the accent goes like that. I'm not sure. Don't know how to pronounce the name. If the Fourier transform, oh, X is a Barnack space, complex. If the Fourier transform is bounded on L2 valued in X, then X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. Remember the theorem back from lecture one? One of the, the obstructions to doing Barnack valued Fourier analysis and harmonic analysis in general is you don't have Plancharel's theorem. You don't have boundedness of the Fourier transform on L2. You generally don't even have it from LP to some LP prime. That was a definition. Barnack space X has Fourier type P. P is between one and two. If the Fourier transform, let's just call it F. If F is bounded from LP valued in X to LP prime valued in X. Now I think I defined this already in one of the lectures at some point. I defined the Fourier transform very early on. I showed that LP has Fourier type P, I think. Example, LP has Fourier type. Well, the Fourier type has to be between one and two. So let's say the minimum of P and P prime, like that. This is for all P between one and infinity. Uh, and I think I said that every Barnack space has Fourier type one.
every x has Fourier type one. Fourier transform is bounded from L1 to L infinity, pretty much trivially. One question. Yep. Uh, when x is isomorphic to a, to a Hilbert space, can you conclude anything on the bound uh, of, on the norm of the Fourier transform? Oh yeah, yeah. I should have actually, this is this is if and only if actually, I should say. The direction I stated in the theorem before is the hard direction. So if X is isomorphic to, a, if X is a Hilbert space, forget isomorphic, if X is a Hilbert space, you can use orthogonality arguments to show that the Fourier transform is bounded on L2. But can and you say X. anything about the bound? Like About the norm, no, generally not. Yeah. If, if you have a, uh, maybe there's some quantitative theorems around there, but no, generally if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space, you can bound the norm of the Hilbert, of the Fourier transform uh, in terms of the isomorphism constants. I don't know if you can say much better than that. Uh, I don't know very much about the quantitative control here, but boundedness of the you. Fourier transform is isomorphic with the Hilbert space, basically. But that's for P equals two. So this is, this boundedness on L2, this is Fourier type two. So what this is saying is every Banach space has Fourier type one. And only those Banach spaces that are isomorphic to Hilbert spaces have Fourier type two. But for P between one and two, you can have Fourier type P. LP, for example, has Fourier type P when P is less than two. So this Fourier type that we defined is with respect to the real line. I've also discussed the Fourier transform on the torus a bit, and that turned out to be quite important. So we have, this is not really a definition. We have the Fourier transform on the real line. We have the Fourier transform on the torus. So let's just say trivially the Fourier transform on the real line maps L1, L1 functions into L infinity functions on the real line. The Fourier transform on the torus maps L1 functions on the torus into bounded sequences indexed by the integers. And we also have, but I didn't define this, the Fourier transform on the integers, which maps L1 sequences on the integers into L infinity functions on the torus. <laughs> if you know about this abstract Fourier analysis, if you know about topological groups, you can actually in general define the Fourier transform on a locally compact abelian group. If you know what that is, then fantastic. If not, don't worry about it. Generally, if you have a locally compact abelian group, you can define the Fourier transform. It maps L1 of the group into L infinity on what's called the dual group. And you can see from what's written up here, the dual group of R is R, the dual group of the torus is the integers, the dual group of the integers is the torus. The dual group of RD is RD, the dual group of TD is ZD, etc. cetera. You, you don't get that from there, but that's true. So whenever you have a locally compact abelian group, you have a Fourier transform and you can extend that to Banach spaces. And then you can define a Fourier type associated with that. You say that X has Fourier type P with respect to the group G, where G is a locally compact abelian group, although we only care about the real line, the torus and the integers. If your Fourier transform maps LP functions on the group into LP prime functions on the dual group. I haven't said anything about what measures we're putting on these groups. It's the Haar measure. If you know locally compact abelian groups, you already know what the Haar measure is. If you don't, the Haar measure on the real line is a Lebesgue measure. The Haar measure on the torus is the Lebesgue measure. The Haar measure on the integers is the counting measure. It's what you expect it to be. It's the translation invariant measure with respect to the group. It's the unique one with that property. So you don't need to think about general groups here. Just think about R, T, Z. With given a group, you can define the notion of Fourier type P for a Banach space. And you can start to ask, does this start to distinguish the geometry of the Banach space? Like to what extent does this vary on the group? If your Banach space has Fourier type P with respect to G, does it have Fourier type P with respect to a different group? Can you go between groups? 
And I'll at least prove this one theorem in the easy case of, you know, realign torus integers. Fourier type P with respect to the real line is equivalent to Fourier type P with respect to the torus, and that's equivalent to Fourier type P with respect to the integers. So at least for these three groups that we care about the most, you only really have one notion of Fourier type. It does vary with different groups, but with these three groups, it's equivalent. And in fact, you can actually replace you can put an arbitrary dimension here and it's still an equivalent property, even as the dimension changes. So there's this, this sort of notion of classical Fourier type where you deal with classical Fourier transform rather than these abstract ones on general locally compact abelian groups. But you can find some, yeah, there are groups where Fourier type with respect to one group does not imply it with respect to a different group. There's also this one group there where Fourier type with respect to that implies Fourier type with respect to all other groups. <laughs> There's like a universal one that's good enough. And um, the, the real line is not universal. It turns out there are groups that are sort of worse than the real line, but it, at least for us, the real line and the torus and the integers are all that really matters. We'll prove that on Tuesday. Proof's actually not too hard. It's a transference result. We already sort of know how to do these things. We did this sort of thing with the Hilbert transform. Boundedness of the real line Hilbert transform is equivalent, well, implies boundedness of the torus Hilbert transform. It turns out they are equivalent going through the UMD property, but there is a more direct proof of that. So we'll prove that. We will also prove at some point, probably on so, Sorry, could you comment, yep. uh, could you comment shortly on what's the universal group? Yes, <laughs> I can tell you what it is. It's called A in the paper that introduces it. I forget which author introduced it. Take Z bot NZ for all N and sum them together. That's universal. That's good enough. Actually, an easier way to do it, I don't know whether it's easier. I think you can actually take, I was about to say the set of all locally compact abelian groups, but I realized that's not actually a set. I don't think. You can somehow take the, maybe I should write product instead of sum here. I forget exactly how this works. Maybe it does need to be the, the product instead of the sum. It's not too important. You can somehow take all of the locally compact abelian groups and jam them together <laughs> and get the locally compact abelian group. At least if you take infinitely many of them and you take the infinite product, the product of locally compact things is locally compact. Is that right? Product of compact things is compact. Anyway, I can't remember. Taking this will work. Yeah, with the, with the correct topology. but With the right topology, yeah. That's the important thing. But at least, yeah, taking something like that is universal. And there's more than one universal group. It's not unique. So Fourier type P with respect to this group, if I remember correctly, implies Fourier type P with respect to every locally compact abelian group. And the fact that there exist groups that aren't enough, and you can, you can take finite groups. Every Barnack space actually has Fourier type two with respect to every finite group. Finite groups don't tell you anything. That's the problem. So what else was I gonna say before finishing up? One other theorem that we'll probably do Tuesday. Fourier type P with respect to the real line, all the torus, all the integers, all equivalent, implies Radermacher type and cotype. So type P and cotype P prime. So remember we had this notion of Radermacher type and cotype which is about whether you can control Radermacher averages by LP norms. So it turns out Fourier type will imply that other kind of type. So in particular, we'll have that Fourier type two, before we know Kwapien's theorem, Fourier type two will imply Radermacher type two and cotype two. And what we'll ultimately show is that that implies that X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. That's what we'll end up showing. I think I'll stop there. If I tell you more about that, it's just gonna get confusing because I don't have any proofs or details. So 
that's but, next week's topic. Yep. But the, but the other way is uh, is uh, not true, right? The other so, way is uh, generally not true, true as far as I know. Sorry, what were you saying? Yeah, yeah, not just the first implication cannot be reversed. This one? Uh, no, 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 up, up uh, a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say that can yeah. be reversed. This one. Yeah, I think that converse is not true, but I don't have an example in mind. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, one more thing I should say, a result that I forgot to mention, I forgot to write it in the notes, and I probably should have written it. I'm not going to prove it. The proof is too hard. If X is UMD, then X has Fourier type greater than one. So X has some non-trivial Fourier type if X is UMD, which then implies some non-trivial Rademacher type and cotype. In fact, the proof is really hard. You can guess who proved it. It was Borgan. That means the proof was hard. <laughs> the interesting thing is that Borgan's proof doesn't tell you very much about what the Fourier type actually is. Basically what happens is as the UMD constants get larger, the Fourier type it gives you gets closer to one. But it's a very nonlinear relation between the UMD constant and the Fourier type that you can prove. So anyway, that's an interesting result that I should have said more about, but didn't sort of links all of these things together. For UMD spaces, you can do nice harmonic analysis. You've got some Fourier type, you've got some writer marker type and cotype, but you don't have control over what it is. It's just greater than one or less than infinity for cotype. Okay. <laughs>